We're going to talk about this organ, right, this incredible organ in our body that really shifts dramatically between the ages of 12 and 24. Now, you guys in this room, because I think almost everybody in this room is a parent or works with kids, you guys remember those shifts of that brand new baby and then that six-month-old that was babbling, and you remember when they started really saying mama, really, they didn't say dada first, they said mama first. You remember those moments of change, and, and it's incredible when you watch your infant grow into a really adorable or pain in the bottom toddler and you see these shifts and then when you you think they're all done but of course you know that they're not done because during adolescence and during the ages of some of these kids that are sitting in that row right over there really extraordinary things are happening and we we need to acknowledge that and we need to be aware of it because we want to celebrate it we want to enforce positive things um, but we also want to know that they're we're all more vulnerable at this age so Three very specific things happen during adolescence, and I, th I try not to rank order them, but the synaptic refinement is huge, and it really only happens at this stage. So we have billions of synapses or impulses racing through our brain, and it is a hot, tangled mess at the age of 12. No one needs tens of billions of these. You need to prune it back. So between 12 and 24, the brain is getting rid of stuff because it needs to get rid of stuff. There are times during adolescence where you are losing 30,000 synapses a second, right? It would be so awesome if your kid was not smoking weed and playing, you know, Fortnite in the basement while that was happening. Because that's probably not synapses that you meant to lose, right? What you really want is your kid to be losing those, pruning back those synapses when they're out playing soccer right now in the field, right? Dodging the, the goose poop that's everywhere. Because those soccer players out there are having an awesome time. The little kids are having an awesome time. The big kids are having an awesome time. And that's a really healthy behavior, being physically active outside, engaged with other people. So this synaptic refinement is incredibly important. If it doesn't happen, you end up with a really um, unhealthy brain. The second thing that happens at this stage is myelination or ensheathing rapid pathways in the brain so you make good, fast decisions. And again, this happens twice. It happens starting around age seven, but it happens again around age 12 on up. So these kids of ours are spectacular and their brains are totally normal because this adolescent brain is all about pushing the envelope. It is a brain that is saying, where's my floor? Where's my ceiling? I want nothing there. It's trying to sort out what does it need to hold on to? What does it need to get rid of? These brains are challenging to parent, right? They are challenging to parent. I have two teenagers. I have a 14 and a 16 year old. They're sitting at home right now. I know they're eating Cheerios. I know they're not cleaning up the kitchen. I know they're on the screen. Hopefully there's somebody's doing some homework, but I know I'm in this, right? I got the same group that you guys have. These brains tend to have more impulsive decision-making, less planning, less pre-planning, a lot more sensation seeking or desire for physical activity. There's never a time in your life where you're more influenced by your peers. This is known as a time where you are hypersensitive to exclusion. And I want everybody to pause on this thought. When you were in second grade and you were sitting by yourself, in a second grader in the cafeteria, you were eating your bologna sandwich and making a little hat out of paper napkin and you didn't care. You didn't care in second grade. And when you were 24 and you're sitting by yourself at work, you're like, whatever, I'm eating my salad, I'm reading the New York Times on my phone, it's all good. But when you're 14 years old and you're by yourself in the cafeteria, every eye in that cafeteria is on you. Every eye is wondering what's wrong with you. Must have been what you wore, your bad haircut, the stupid thing you said in class before. All you can think about is that you don't fit in. Because again, this is a time of hypersensitivity to exclusion, and it is why kids are desperate to fit in with their peers. And it's why they will make sometimes terrible decisions in order to fit in with their peers. That's just the way it is in adolescence. So it's hard. It's hard to parent that because you just want to, I mean, who in this room would go back and relive high school, middle school? Okay, there's always that one person. There's one person in the room. Let, can, let me see that hand again. Where is she? she not middle school. High school you would do, but not middle Okay, okay. Um, most of us wouldn't even go back to high school because of that, actually. Because we actually felt like we weren't fitting in, like we weren't pretty enough, we weren't smart enough, we weren't athletic enough, we were too smart, we were too much of a jock. Like, name what it was, and it wasn't going to work, right? People didn't like you no matter what you were. You felt targeted all the time. You knew you were the most popular kid. It didn't feel good, right? Even the mean girls don't feel good. It feels terrible. So... 
This defines what this adolescent brain looks like. There's nothing wrong with it. It's normal. We just have to work with what it is, right? And help sort of guide our kids and, and help hope that they uh, become young adults someday and leave our house and are successful in whatever it is they want to do. Emotions are felt very intensely, huge emotional spectrum. I was in the parking lot and my daughter texted me screaming text, you know, the screaming text you get from your kids. And then I was like, I can't respond to this. So I called her and then she screamed at me with her voice and then she hung up on me. And literally, like, like we'd had a really nice exchange seven seconds earlier. And in between, like, I'm not even sure I did wrong, right? But I, then I just hung up the phone. I said, okay, yeah, it's okay. She's, she's 16 years old. There's nothing I'm going to do to change where she is right now. She'll tell me tomorrow morning that she loves me, maybe or maybe not, and it's okay. Like, you've got to let it roll off your back at this age, right? So, I just added this slide because I think it's a kind of an interesting thought. It's helped me understand it. This is the teenage brain. I am not who you think I am. I'm not who I think I am. I am who I think you think I am, right? That's how it feels to be a teenager, and that is a dreadful way to feel. And if anybody in this room who's an adult still feels that way, First of all, I don't want you to feel that way. I want you to feel better than that. But tell you, I tell you, you, we need to work. We need to work with you because you don't have self-love. You don't have self-compassion. And we need to build you back up again because that's dreadful. That is dreadful, but that defines adolescence right there. So this brain of our teenagers is extraordinary in doing great work. But because of this developmental stage it is in, it is very susceptible to developing addictive behaviors, right? All addiction starts while the brain is developing. And this is the cover of National Geographic one year ago in one month. So it was in September of 2017. It was entitled The Neurobiology of Addiction. It talks about how the brain gets hijacked when exposed to addictive substances. So before you go give your talk next week, you're going to Google it, and there's some video associated with it, and you're going to read the article, because I'm going to tell you a story that's really easy to understand. I acknowledge it's a more complicated group of pathways that get disrupted. So the part of the brain that breaks with addiction is the reward circuit of the brain, the happy part of the brain that says, wow, what you're doing is good behavior and it's going to keep you alive longer, because it is this very deep, ancient reward circuit of the brain that every single living creature on the planet has, whether you're a cricket or a koala or you're a human being, we all have the same thing deep in our brain that says finding food, finding water, and finding a mate is your purpose to be on this planet, right? Most of us don't think this way, but it is the reason we exist here. And in, at the end of the day, with the zombie apocalypse, we will come back to this baseline level. How do I survive long enough to keep the next generation or two ahead of me surviving, right? And that is what your ancestors did. And in fact, your ancestors were awesome. They did great, because you exist, right? Some other people's ancestors weren't so good because they don't exist, right? So this is a critical part of the brain that tells you to survive. And it is this part of the brain that breaks with addiction, right? This is the reason why preventing addiction and the work that is done by the New Canaan Cares Coalition is so critical. Because preventing the disease of addiction is so much easier to do than actually treating it. It is a hard disease to treat. I treat it every single day, every single day. For the last 18 years I've been a doctor, I've taken care of people who have substance use. And it's really challenging. And some people get better and some people don't. So the chemical that is racing through the reward circuit of the brain is the one that everybody in this room could talk to me about. And that's dopamine, right? It's your happy chemical. It's your joy chemical. It is the holy smokes that was awesome, do it again chemical in the brain. And we all have behaviors that we participate in that give us, give us dopamine, that make us happy. What, shout them out. What are things you guys do that, that give you dopamine? What was that? You psych. This is a specific exercise. She bikes, she gets on a bike, she gets a dopamine spike. What do the other people do? You eat candy. Yes, sugar is a super addictive substance that gives us dopamine. I can't tell you how much sugar is in my car right now, a huge amount, because it takes three hours to get here and three hours to get home, and it makes me happy and it keeps me awake. Got it. Yeah, what else? Social media, so feeling like you connect to other human beings through social media, right? I think social media is a, any, actually most screen in, engagement gives you a spike of dopamine. It is one of the reasons why screen can be addictive. Right? Because you get a spike. Every time somebody gives you a like on whatever it is you posted, you get a little tiny spike in your dopamine because someone says, you did good today. That was a good thing. You got a tiny pat on the back. It's a very rewarding thing.
So associated with dopamine in the brain is fine motor skills. That's why people who struggle with nicotine specifically, as an example, will say, I miss un uncrinkling that cellophane from the package. I miss tapping down the box, removing the cigarette, lighting the match. Like, I miss all of that. Because what they really miss is the motion of the fingers in the mouth. And why everybody in treatment needs to keep their fingers really, really busy. And most of us who are on the treatment side aren't keeping our people's fingers busy enough. We should be beating and crocheting and doing basket weaving everywhere because it keeps your fingers occupied, right? Which helps decrease some of the cravings in the brain. There are two behaviors associated with dopamine in the brain. And one is called compulsion and the other one is perseveration. I cannot stop thinking about this and I have to do this thing. I have to do this thing, right? Those two behaviors, when it comes to survival, finding food, finding water, and finding a mate are awesome behaviors. Being compulsive is the reason you guys are here. Your, your great, great, great grandmother was a perseverator. Lucky you. You needed her to be that way. You needed the last thought before going to bed is how am I going to find enough clean drinking water and calories to keep them alive? Because 200 years ago, right, in this part of Connecticut or anywhere in this country it was really hard to live. That's just 200 years ago. It was super hard. I'm reading George Washington's biography right now. Um, and it's great, Ron Chernow's uh, Washington, other people have read it. But anyway, Revolutionary War, we nearly lost multiple times, and our soldiers were starving. They were living on nothing because there was no food available. Because that's what our lives were like 200 years ago. I stopped at the gas station on the way down here. There were 18 billion calories at checkout, <laughs> right? We have no shortage of calories in our life. That's actually a health problem for most of us. But my point is, is that this behavior of compulsion and perseveration is what keeps us alive. It is those two behaviors that help define addiction. Compulsive and perseverating people struggle with addiction. And it's so frustrating to take care of them. So who in this room is in the medical field or therapy field and takes care of people with addiction? Sometimes you get a little bit mad. A little frustrated, like, dude, you were here last week struggling with alcohol. I just saw you and you need to get better. And I always take a breath and remind myself about compulsive perseverating behavior and it allows me to say, yeah, this is what defines why they do what they do. So I make an argument that we all have a certain amount of dopamine in our system and I say here, it's 100 units, there's no way to measure this, you are not gonna call your GP tomorrow and get a serum dopamine because they'll laugh at you and mock you a little bit. Um, there's no way to measure how much dopamine, but some of us have high dopamine. We feel good all the time. We're those happy-go-lucky golden retrievers. My best friend is this. Her dopamine at baseline is 110. That's just who she is. My baseline dopamine isn't 100. My baseline dopamine is actually on the low side. I would argue I'm at like an 85 or 90 right? And some of us live there too. What do I do? I exercise. I have to have a lot of exercise in order to feel good most days. And if I don't get it, and my kids say this to me, you are so crabby. Have you gotten any exercise today? I came here a little early. I walked around your beautiful track, right? Beautiful track. So thanks, New Canaan, for paying for that. It was lovely. <laughs> um, so there's a variation of dopamine, maybe between 85 and 108 or so. But this is the problem with the way things work in our brain. If our normal set point of dopamine is about 100, and you find food that's going to keep your family alive for a while longer, or you're going to go have a big sugar fix, you get a spike in dopamine. It goes to 150 and then it goes back to normal. You have sex, it's consensual, your dopamine spikes to 200 and then it goes back to normal because those behaviors are consistent with survival, okay? And for 200,000 years that we have been on this planet in this human form, your brain knows what those levels are. 85, 150, 200 on a good night, awesome. When you use a drug like cocaine, your dopamine goes to 350. When you use a strong prescription opiate, or heroin or fentanyl, your dopamine will spike between 500 and 1,000. You use a drug like crystal methamphetamine, it'll go to 1,300, right? Huge spikes in dopamine when exposed to these substances. Now, we could talk about dopamine spikes for most addictive behaviors, some of which are not really even measurable. So I'm not gonna talk you through all of this, but the dopamine is controlled, this equation in the brain is controlled by three things. How much dopamine is produced, how many dopamine receptors receive the information on the other side of the synaptic cleft, and then how many little reuptake vacuums there are sucking dopamine out. Cocaine works in only one way. It affects one thing in the equation. It turns off the vacuums. It turns off the vacuum so the dopamine builds up in the synaptic cleft. You would think that cocaine use would be easy to treat. There's no treatment. For people who struggle with cocaine, there's no treatment besides paying people not to use cocaine. That's about the only thing that seems to work. So, but it should be easy to treat because it's only one thing that breaks, but it isn't. 
Opiates are different. They work through a negative feedback loop through um, the opiate receptor to the GABA receptor. At the end of the day, opiates make more dopamine. They throw more dopamine out there. Now, we can do this pathway with every addictive behavior or substance. At the end of the day, it ends up in dopamine somewhere, and it breaks one thing in, the, in that, or two things in that equation. So this is the problem, is that when your brain is used to 150 or 200 on a great night, and it starts seeing spikes of dopamine to 350, 500, 1300, your brain's response to that is, oh my gosh, something is wrong. There's something wrong that's giving me a dopamine this high. I've got to turn down the volume. I need to downregulate because this is not normal. There's nothing in evolution that told me this was okay. So your brain's response is to downregulate, right? It stops making dopamine. It erases 80% of the dopamine receptor, turns on every vacuum in sight. So when you're struggling with addiction, you wake up in the morning and your new dopamine set point's like a 40 or a 45. You're a miserable person. I'm not talking withdrawal symptoms. You are a miserable human being that does not have survival level of dopamine in the brain. And your brain is saying, you need to fix this. You need to feel better than this. This is terrible. You're desperately trying to achieve homeostasis. That's all you're trying to do. You're trying to feel normal again. So you continue to drink, you continue to use drugs, even though you know it's destroying your entire life because your brain is so desperate just to feel normal again. You get yourself up to an 85, you're having a great day. It's a really hard disease to treat because it breaks this part of the brain that tells you to live or die every day. And again, if all we can do is prevent and even two people in this room from developing addiction, then we should feel good about that because again, we need to fund prevention. And states nationwide do not fund preventive services. I'm glad to be in a school district that clearly makes a commitment to this sort of thing. Um, so it's a concept of a broken brain. I, I cut out a slide and I regret it. Do you guys give me a second? Can I unhide a slide? Do you mind? I've been sitting here regretting it and I don't want to regret it anymore. Oh, there it is. Let me unhide it. I changed my slide deck for you guys, and so now I'm sort of like on the fly from current slide. Okay, so let's talk about, let's talk about these two people, because this, this, I think, this is the reason I do this work, is these two people. So this 68-year-old guy, he lives in Darien, okay? And he wakes up one morning, it's pretty early, and his chest is really heavy. He actually feels like somebody may be sitting on his chest, and he's rubbing his chest, and his wife's like, you don't look so good. And he's like, no, 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 it's okay. It must have been what I ate last night. And she's like, you really look terrible. I'm calling 911. And Darian, like EMS, is there instantly. And they look at this guy, and they're like, holy smokes, you're having a heart attack, right? And they give him some oxygen, sublingual nitroglycerin, and an aspirin, and a beta block, and they put in a big bore IV, like he's crashing in front of them. And they're like, we can get him to Norwalk Hospital. They send that EKG from his living room to Norwalk, and Norwalk's like, up, 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 no, no, not coming here. Get him up either to Yale New Haven or get him to, what's my other big hospital south of here? I don't know. What was that? Yeah, we, I need a big hospital because this guy needs quadruple bypass surgery, right? And within two hours, this guy's in the operating room and he has quadruple bypass surgery, right? That's how this guy's life is going to look. He's going to be in the hospital for a week in the ICU and then he's going to be a week in the cardiac care unit. He's going to need a social work consult because he's going to get depressed. He's going to have a new cardiology appointment, new primary care appointment. He's going to go to Norwalk Hospital for his 12 weeks of cardiac rehab. And we just saved his life, which is great. How much money we just spent? Yeah, 200 up, I would say 250, quarter million dollars. That's probably what this guy cost, okay? His next door neighbor in Darien is this 24-year-old girl. She went to Sacred Heart. She got a soccer scholarship there. She went there when she was 18, went to Darien High School, and she um, had an ACL tear at the age of 19 and blew her knee and blew her soccer scholarship. Um, and she was devastated. Um, she st struggled with a little depression to begin with, but when she realized she may not even be able to afford to go back to school and that she'd never get to play soccer again, she um, was a mess. And she realized she felt better when she took the oxycodone that the surgeon gave her after her ACL repair. And in fact, she kept going back to the orthopedic surgeon and said, I think I need a little bit more. After three months, he finally cut her off, was like, what is wrong with you? You don't need any more. She started to buy the pills on the street at the age of 19, which is a normal process, and then um, realized she could buy heroin for a lot less money. So she's 24 now, though. This was when she was 19. She really struggled for many years. But about nine months ago, she moved back home with her mom in Darien. Um, she got out of the bad 
unhealthy relationship she was in. She's been going to a Suboxone clinic for the last nine months. She has a new therapist who's been helping her. She's going to yoga. She's realizing she can be a physically healthy person without being a soccer player forever. Um, she just got a job last week. She has not had a paycheck in a long time. She got her first paycheck yesterday. She's feeling good. But her mom is pretty smart. And when that morning, when she knocks on that bathroom door and it's locked and there's no answer behind the door, that mom freaks out and kicks the door down and finds her daughter lying on the ground, blue and not breathing. She calls 911 first, but then she administers the drug overdose um, chemical called naloxone, but her daughter doesn't start breathing. At this point, EMS arrives. They have at least two vials on them. They also have IM and IV naloxone. It takes five more doses of Narcan before this young woman comes back to life. She's brought to Norwalk Hospital ER, and what do they do for her? Paul, can I ask you, what do they do for her in Norwalk Hospital? Yeah, they give her a, a tri-fold brochure with a bunch of numbers, right? She's vomiting, she's acute diarrhea, she feels terrible, she's embarrassed and ashamed. Just call these numbers, bye-bye, see ya. That's what they, that's, that's, I'm not putting Norwalk under a bus, guys. This is every emergency room in the entire country. Name the hospital, it happens there. Let me tell you more about my 68-year-old guy, her neighbor, right? The guy who just had the massive anterior wall MI. He smokes a half, a half a pack of cigarettes a day. He's cut down. He was at about two packs a day. He's been slowly weaning off. He kicks back a 12-pack of beer every day. He goes to McDonald's at least three times a week. He'd go more if his wife wasn't going to kill him for it. Does this guy have addiction? What's he addicted to? Nicotine? Alcohol? Fat, chemicals, sugar, whatever's in all that stuff he eats, right? He's totally addicted to all that stuff. Did he create his heart attack? I always say absolutely yes, he did, right? The number one killer in our country is tobacco. The number two killer in our country is lack of exercise and poor nutrition. Number three is alcohol. He partakes in all three. He created his heart attack. 68-year-old guys don't need to have heart attacks. They're preventable. He had a family history of heart attacks, but that doesn't matter. Both of his parents were smokers. Once you scoot the smoking out of the way, most of us are going to live a really, really long time. We just are, unless we have something un un unlucky happen to us, like cancer or we get hit by something. So my point is, is that here's a guy who clearly struggles with addiction. And anybody roll into his living room or, or in, in the you know, Yale New Haven ER and say, you know what? You're an addict. I'm not going to drop a quarter million dollars on you. You created this heart attack. Why am I going to provide you any medical care? Anybody do that to him? Anybody shame him and blame him for creating his disease? Nobody did. I'm a primary care doctor. I take care of chronic disease all day, right? I take care of people who are overweight and just struggle, right? You know how many of my patients are perfect and are doing everything right? Most nobody is, right? Because who in this room is absolutely perfect, right? Maybe you're perfect, my biker over there, right? But in general, we all make decisions that aren't so great for our health. You know, I stopped in New Haven on the way down here and I got myself a pizza, because I used to live in New Haven. I know how good New Haven pizza is. But as I drove here, dropping like hot cheese on myself, I was like, this is gonna make me feel so gross for the rest of the night. I won't have had a salad all day. Why did I do this, right? But my point is that we all do this. And, and the reason I do this work is I find this disparity in their care so outrageous. You know what they needed to do for that 24-year-old that at Norwalk? They didn't need to spend money on her. They needed to pat her on the back and say, you've been doing really well. You've been, your mom told me for nine months you've been doing great. And let me just remind you, people start to get cocky. Between six, and nine, and 12 months, that's when people start to feel good again. They feel normal again. Their life is back on track, and they think they can just dip in a toe. They just think, just once I can do this. And there's no just once. There's no just once that's safe anymore, because it really is going to kill you, right? And they could say that to her, how proud they are of her, how well she's doing, that likely she needs more support right now, and that paycheck, probably she can't control her own money, right? I told you, she just got a job. She got paid yesterday. Many people newly in recovery, money in their pockets, burning a hole. Maybe her mom needs to manage her money for a while. That's the conversation. It was a 10-minute nursing conversation. That's all it took, right? Not to have her feel like a piece of dirt. You think she doesn't already feel like a piece of dirt? You know who hates themselves more than anybody else? People who struggle with addiction. The number one thing that's hard to do is rebuild a sense of a self-esteem and self-love. So again, no money needed to be spent on her to provide her good medical care. But this doesn't happen anywhere. And again, I find it outrageous.
Okay, thanks for letting me show you that slide because that one matters to me a lot. Okay, let's talk again. Brain, chemistry, PET scans. That middle brain, totally healthy brains. All that orange is dopamine. Those brains on the right are people who struggle with addiction. The top one is cocaine. You don't see any dopamine. The next one down is crystal meth. That brain, not only dopamine, but that's like a totally messed up looking brain. Um, the third one down is alcohol, and the final one down is somebody who struggles with heroin. I want people to look at that alcohol brain for a second. There's still dopamine on that alcohol brain. Alcohol is a drug in our society that causes a tremendous amount of harm. It does. It causes harm to ourselves personally. It causes harm in our family. A lot of us come from families where there is way too much alcohol consumed. You know, we live in families with alcohol, um, alcoholism. But the wheels come off the alcohol bus pretty late in the game, right? It takes a while of, uh, of us being functional alcoholics before we lose our jobs, we lose our partners, and we get our second OUI, and we're facing actual jail time. So people, a lot of us are functional alcoholics, right? 13% of Americans meet all standards of being alcoholics, and it's becoming a bigger problem, and I would argue it's becoming a bigger problem in communities that have money, and is becoming a bigger problem amongst women, and we're going to talk about that. So what is it our kids um, can do or what is it we can do to help our kids? There's three things that cause addiction. The first is a hi family history or genetics. The second is early exposure while the brain is developing. And the third one is a history of childhood trauma. The childhood trauma I'm going to breeze by just because I have some younger people in the room. So having poor mental health or struggling with anxiety or depression or another mood disorder does not necessarily cause addiction. It doesn't. The problem is that when you're 14 and you have terrible social anxiety, you could barely get yourself to school and you certainly can't go to a party or join a team, and you realize that when you drink or you smoke pot, you feel better, right? You're the life of the party when you're drunk, right? Then you become a person who has generalized or social anxiety disorder who exposes their brain while developing to an addictive substance. So that is about early exposure. It isn't that the mental health disorder created the addiction. It's the self-medication that creates then the addiction. So the genetics of addiction are unbelievably powerful. It is hard to find any other disease in medicine with this kind of genetics. 50% of all of addiction is defined by your genetics. If you have a parent or a grandparent who struggles with addiction, you have about a 50% chance yourself. So who needs to hear that? Ray, who needs to hear it? Your kids actually need to know that. Now that's a really uncomfortable thing for me to say to you. I think it's uncomfortable for many of us as parents. But I'm telling you, your kids deserve to understand what their risk is of addiction because they get to influence the next thing entirely on their own. And they get to influence it in this way that almost entirely erases the genetic risk, okay? So when I sat down with my own three kids, I didn't go into the gory details. I didn't tell them the who, the what, the why, and all the ter terrible things that happened. I just said, look, we have strong family history of addiction in our family. You guys are at much higher risk than the average person because of that. And because of that, you three sitting in front of me at the kitchen counter need to delay your use of an addictive substance as long as possible because we need to protect you even more so than the average person needs to be protected, okay? So all addiction is considered a developmental pediatric disease. It starts prior to the age of 23, 22, 24. If you can get to the age of 23 or 24 not having used an addictive substance, the likelihood of you developing addiction is about 1%. If you take somebody who has a genetic history, it's about 3%, meaning that you don't get to entirely erase it, but you get to go from 50% to 3% by just delaying use. How amazing is that? Like, when do you ever get to change your genetic outcome? You don't usually get to do that. And I tell you, when you tell this to kids, that I don't stand there with my glass of wine and be like, don't ever drink, it's going to kill you, right? <laughs> I say to my kids, look, your brain is still developing. We know that while your brain is developing, alcohol, marijuana, nicotine, and other substances, stimulants, let's say, impact your brain in a negative way. And for some of us, we're much more susceptible to get grooves down, groove down pathways in our brain that will be with us for the rest of our lives. This is a message about delaying use. When you're 15 years old and you start drinking, and drinking here is defined as two alcoholic beverages a week, just two alcoholic beverages a week. 40% of those 15-year-olds become alcoholics. If you wait till age 21, 7% become alcoholics. So that's about half the national rates if you wait till the legal age to drink. 
Now that may seem impossible to you guys. Like maybe it is impossible to drink nothing or almost nothing by the age of 21 or 22 or 23, but I disagree with that. I actually think that's sort of like we create a world where we think it's fine to give our kids wine or beer or whatever at the age of 16, 17 or 18. Like we create that situation. Right? It doesn't have to be that way. There's a reason, and I'm not saying that when the legal age was set at 21 that people was, were looking at this data. They were not looking at this data. That was just what they set. Um, our kids actually are making great decisions. Like, they make awesome decisions. And in fact, when I talk to middle schools or high school kids, I just sit there and say, you guys, your generation is doing so much better than any generation 50 years back. Like, you guys are fabulous. You're drinking at really low rates. Your use of illicit substances, other than marijuana, is really low. And when you ask a 14-year-old, I got some young people in the room. I don't want to call you guys out because it's kind of mean. But can I ask you, what do you guys think of cigarettes? Yeah. You should never use them, yep. Any other words you would have to describe cigarettes? Yeah, they're definitely addictive, absolutely. They're actually one of the most addictive ones there is. Most people say they're disgusting. I have kids say revolting, right? They're disgusted by cigarettes. This generation, you guys remember when they were toddlers and they were in the back of the car and they're like, mommy, somebody's smoking. And you're like, I know, it's not illegal to smoke. But they acted like possibly you should call the police. Do you guys remember that? Because smoking has become so outside the norm. Now, some of us in this room still struggle with a nicotine addiction. I value that. I'm not shaming anybody. But my point is, it's less and less and less. And this generation here will eradicate paper cigarettes because they are disgusted by them, right? Because public health messaging really works. This is the problem. Their sense of harm with cigarettes is super high. Their use is low. Sense of harm with marijuana is super low. So what do our kids say about pot? Anything, good or bad, I don't care. Yeah, it's natural, it's organic, it grows in the ground, it's better than the pharmaceuticals. It's no big deal. Everybody's doing it. What else? It's not addictive. This gateway drug model is bogus Reagan era, era anti-drug talk. What was the other one? Yes, they will make it legal, not legal in Connecticut, but it is legal in Massachusetts, right across the border, right? There's lots of states now, or at, I think, 11, maybe, and it's increasing where it is legal. What else? Wow. So I haven't, nobody's ever said that one. She said um, it's in TV shows and movies. It's so normalized behavior that it looks the way that cigarettes did for us, right? That it's just sort of been embedded as normal behavior in, in cultural their cultural media. Okay. Um, it, cures, it cures my disease. It helps me sleep. It helps me with my anxiety. It's medicine. It helps people. I have, when I've done this talk in high school sometimes, a kids in the back of the room will be like, it cures cancer. It's, you know, you should go off your seizure meds because it fixes it. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to have a nervous breakdown when I hear things like that. Okay. So at this stage, as the sense of harm with pot is super low, the use has gone way up. And there's three things that happen while your brain is developing. I only cover two of the three. The third thing is the final dopamine receptors get laid down in the outer shell of the brain. The outer cortex of the brain is where all the dopamine final receptors get laid, which is why all addiction is a developmental disease, because you guys understand what all, all addictive behaviors and substances do to the dopamine system. There's a receptor that gets activated at this time called anandamide. We are not positive about anandamide. I went to Yale. Yale's a real neuroscience school. Um, we had some great neuroscience teachers. And I went back and I was like, I don't remember that neurotransmitter. Did I sleep during that class? I couldn't remember it. I went back and looked. It wasn't there because it got uh, discovered after I graduated. But anandamide, we think that part of its job is to figure out the synaptic pruning, what gets clipped and what gets kept. The problem with anandamide, is that it is a naturally occurring neuroendocannabinoid. It is the mirror image to THC or the psychoactive cannabinoid in marijuana. Your brain can't tell those two things apart. So here I have this neuroreceptor in the brain that does this incredibly important thing while your kid's brain is developing. And then all of a sudden THC gets introduced to the brain. And it's like using a sledgehammer instead of a scalpel to determine what gets kept and what gets clipped in your kid's brain. What happens with marijuana to somebody over the age of 25 in the privacy of their own home? I don't personally really care. I did not vote for it in Massachusetts. I think it's the tobacco industry in disguise. 
Um, but as long as you're not getting on my roads or operating on my knee or babysitting my kids, what you do over the age of 25, that's on you, right? I don't think it's worse than alcohol. Under the age of 25, I consider this a neurotoxic drug. And what troubles me is the chasm between what the kids think and what the science thinks, okay? That is a big space right there. And until we get a little closer together on this, I think we're gonna be in trouble. Okay, it's, it's been a while since we had, maybe somebody can come up with an example where the chasm is this big. I don't know what it is, think about it. If you come up with one, let me know, okay? So here I have, again, THC, mirror image, disrupting how the brain develops. So we know it has an impact on attention, verbal learning, memory, processing speed, and that sticks around even when you're not high. This is this very famous study from New Zealand, which is a 30-year study. It follows people from teenagehood all the way up to age 40. And I'm gonna compare the two extremes just to make the point, okay? So the gray line on the top of three different bar graphs are kids who used marijuana zero times between the ages of 14 and 21. I'm gonna compare them to the red category, the other extreme, kids who used marijuana 400 times or more between the ages of 14 and 21. So that's in a span of seven years, 400 times of pot use in seven years. That's actually not that much. Quite honestly, it's a couple times a week, once a week. Like it's fairly light use by today's standards, right? There's a lot of heavy daily users of marijuana these days. Two comparisons, okay. So going to college and graduating by age 25, 36% of the kids who never used pot graduated from college by the age of 25. 2% of the kids who used marijuana 400 times or more graduated from college by the age of 25. Unemployment rate by the age of 25. Unemployment for kids who never used it, 21%. 52% of the kids who used marijuana 400 times or more were unemployed. That for me is a kid living in my basement at the age of 27. I don't want them. I like my kids. I want them gone. I want them to go to school. I want them to pay their taxes. I want them to walk their own dog, right? That for me is successful parenting is when my kids launch and leave me and maybe come back and visit sometimes. I don't want them living with me. This is my concern, okay, this stuff. Now the problem with every single study that we have on pot is first of all, it doesn't happen in this country because it's a schedule one drug and you can't use federal funds to, to study schedule one drugs, um, is that it was all using the old marijuana with a THC level, the psychoactive make you high component of 3% or less. Because prior to 1995, that's all we had was marijuana with a THC of 3% or less. Now, there's nothing grown in a field anywhere in this country that's anywhere less than 9% THC, but it goes up to as high as 18% THC in the field, and they're making it more and more potent, grown in the backyard in my neighborhood. Um, then what we do is it gets concentrated into hash oil and earwax and butter and shatter, and this stuff is sitting between 50 and 80% THC. So who in this room thinks that using a 60% THC product is gonna give you a healthier brain? Right? Like, I can't even compare. This is like Tylenol to fentanyl. Like, the comparison between these two drugs, they're totally different drugs. So when kids say, your generation smoked pot, you turned out fine. I'm telling you, this is not the same chemical. This is a completely intentionally altered chemical. And my worry is that what we know about the old stuff is it's bad for the brain. What we don't know about this stuff is, I guarantee you, it's really bad for the brain. Um, gazillion ways to get pot into your system. You can drink it in beer and milk and eat it in spaghetti sauce. You can rub it on your skin in a salve. You can put it under your tongue as a tincture. You can vape it. You can eat it. You guys now know enough to understand that all addiction starts while the brain is developing. Who is the marijuana's industry? Who is their market? Children, right? They're not going after you. They're not going after me. I don't know how old you are, but we're too old for them, okay? They're not going to make an addict out of me but they're gonna go after our kids because their job is they have to addict this next generation. This next generation who is saying, who's beeping, is that me? It may be me. I don't care if it's somebody else. I'm just worried if I'm the one who's beeping. I apologize if it's me. But what bothers me is that this generation will say no more to Joe Camel and the Marlboro Man, but this industry, right, is all basically funded by tobacco and people looking to make money. They will have been taken by the marijuana industry, whose intention is to addict them, which is why all the products you see in Colorado look like this. They are edible candies, look-alike things. Every one of those candy bars has between 50 and 90% THC, and each of those candy bars has 12 servings of marijuana in it. Right? They're intended for you to take a Kit Kat bar and break it into 12 pieces and eat one piece and put 11 pieces back into a baggie, which no one will ever do, right? 
in a million years. So they're intended to make you super high and, in fact, likely psychotic, right? So I am living in a world in Massachusetts where I will be welcoming in the psychotic young people into the ER because they're off the walls crazy, and what am I going to do with them? We're just going to strap them down to a bed. Right? We'll increase everybody's wait time. Like, it's not going to be a pleasant thing in Massachusetts. The first stores just have been licensed. The first two stores are in Western Mass, where I live. They open in two weeks. And you will be seeing those products. Maybe not this far south, but Hartford will get it. So is marijuana addictive? We used to say nicotine was the most addictive substance. That's what we used to say. And we used to say the old marijuana at 3% THC was pretty low in comparison. It was 9% addictive. But when you start when you're a teenager, the addiction rates go up to 17%. And when you use today's pot, it's between 30 and 50% addictive, which means it's more addictive than nicotine. Right? So please don't let anybody tell you this is all good all the time. It's going to cure grandma's cancer. Please don't buy into that. Right? We're getting sold a bill of goods, and I want Connecticut to fight hard on this thing getting legalized here, because from a legislative standpoint, they're all about the money. They think they're going to get tax revenue. I'm telling you, whatever tax revenue you, you get is going to be spent threefold in terms of people getting addicted, people in car accidents, kids failing in school. It just will harm society. So educate people. Slide deck. You're going to take the slide deck. You're going to go give this talk, OK? Okay, so last year was the first time um, that we saw marijuana outpace nicotine with teenagers. Last year, is that's when we see it outpace. And yeah, we're going to talk about it. We're going to get there. I'm not going to leave you on my jeweling, okay? So let's talk about alcohol for a minute, because I'm not going to deny the harm that alcohol does to society. Kids will say, pot is better than alcohol. I did, you guys didn't mention that. I didn't mention to you. They always compare those two. And I never say to them, I think alcohol is that good. I drink. I drink in tremendous moderation, partly because I take care of people with alcoholism all day, every day, and it has an impact on me now. Um, but one third of us in this country drink absolutely zero. We never drink. And one third of us drink just a tiny bit, like a drink a week, a couple drinks a month, very light drinking. And the final one third of us drink it all. We drink everything in the liquor store, just one third of us. The final, quart the final um, decile, the final 10% of us drink on average 10 drinks a day. 10 drinks, okay? So now most of those people aren't here because they're drinking already. To get 10 <laughs> drinks in, at 10 minutes of 8, you had to start, OK? But people act like that's a big number, but it doesn't take much to get to 10 drinks. So who worked as a bartender in this room? In an average cocktail, if 1.5 ounces of hard liquor is considered a drink, how many drinks might be in a single cocktail? Yeah, OK? Probably three. Most cocktails have at least two or three drinks in them. So that's what a drink is, okay? A beer is a 12-ounce beer at 5%. I drink a hoppy beer at 7.5%, right? Sometimes it comes in a 16-ounce can. Done. That's like a drink in three quarters. So you've got to do your math. This is what a glass of wine is. It is five ounces of wine. So every day I talk to my patients and I say, tell me about your relationship to alcohol. And my women say, oh, you know, I have a couple drinks tonight. I'm like, oh, yeah, what are you drinking? I drink wine. Well, how much are you pouring? You know, I pour a normal size wine glass. <laughs> Right? Because we all have these giant goblets that can go in the dishwasher that are really thick, mason jars on a stem, whatever it is, and we glug, 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 glug. And I say to my loves, I say, you need to measure what you're pouring, because five ounces is a glass of wine, and my guess is, is you're maybe pouring 10 or 12. And if you're doing that, you're really having two or three drinks with every one of your one glasses. And you told me you drank a couple, so you just got yourself to six. And I need you to ask yourself, what's that about? Why are you drinking like that? Why did you need six glasses of wine tonight? Because so often we walk in the door, and I'm talking as a working mom to other women in this room, right? Our lives are really hard, right? A lot of us are up at five, and we're doing laundry, and we're walking the dog, and we're checking the schedule, or we're making sure the kids' stuff got done, and who's doing what and when, and I will go home tonight. I'll get home at midnight. Breakfast dishes will still be there, right? And there'll be 14 pieces of paper on the counter that I needed to sign, and my daughter will still be mad at me and have left some love, lovely hate letter for me, and, and I'll have to fix this problem that I didn't fix for her. Like, my night will continue, because that's what working women's lives are like, right? Super complicated. And we often walk in the door after a terrible day, and we think we deserve a glass of wine. We need something to calm us down. We need something to transition us from that to something different. We self-medicate. And that's what your kids see. They see you walk in after a tough day at work, and the first thing they watch you do is to uncork a bottle of wine or flip the top of a beer can. The message you send to your kids is that when you're stressed out, when you're overwhelmed, that drinking is the way to solve that. That's the message your kids see. And if more of us walked in the door and said, man, I've had a hard day, I'm going to go for a walk. The dog and I are going to go for a walk. Anybody want to come with me? Want to come? 
I have some John Cabot Zen on my phone right now. I'm going to go sit down. I'm going to go do a 10 minute mindfulness meditation exercise in the living room. Anybody want to join me on that? What if we as adults did more modeling of not turning to alcohol? What if we actually had adult parties where alcohol wasn't even present? Can you imagine that? Right? It's very few times that adults have parties without alcohol. I'm telling you, try it sometime. Most of us don't really need it. It's not worth the calories, right? Hit menopause, it ain't worth the calories. <laughs> and the industry is targeting women. It used to be, so I trained at old Boston City Hospital, and I, my dad trained there 50 years prior to me getting there, and all we did was take care of alcoholism. That's what we did. We were specialists in it at Boston City. It was a great place to train. And um, back in the day, the ratio of alcoholism, men and women, was 9 to 1. 9 to 1. I had a handful of women I took care of, almost none. The ratio has now shifted to 6 to 3, male to female, and that has happened in 15 years. Very fast transition of more women struggling with alcohol, and it's because of this, right? You women, us women, are getting taken advantage of by the liquor industry. There's no health benefit to alcohol. I don't care what anybody tells you. The amount of alcohol that may have some health benefit, an ounce a day maybe, who's going to open a bottle of wine for an ounce, right? It will be bad in three days. It is the liquor industry that funds that, right? Exercise, eating well, having connections to other human beings. Those are the healthiest things you can do. Don't drink. Don't think you're being health beneficial by drinking. Okay, um, this is something I think is interesting. Parents will say to me, I want to teach my kid to drink before they go to college. I want to train them so they can know what's too much. And I'm like, oh, no, no, that's still a terrible idea. First of all, it's illegal to give an underage person a beverage, including and most especially other people's kids. So don't think that hosting the after football party at your house, you're helping anybody. You may think you're keeping those kids off the road. You're taking a person that you don't know that much about because they may or may not be your own kids and you're exposing their brain to an addictive substance. That's what you're doing. And so when they've done studies on this, parents giving alcohol to their kids, uh, what it shows is that these kids have higher rates of alcoholism and binge drinking behaviors. You are not training them to be better drinkers. You're just exposing them to a drug that's harmful, okay? People will say to me, but in Europe, they drink all the time in Europe and they're fine. I'm like, huh, I've been hearing that for years, so finally I was like, let me look at the data of alcoholism worldwide, ready? Okay, addiction rates of top 25 countries in the world, there they are, Every one of them is in Europe, with the exception of South Korea, South Africa, and Australia. Now, Eastern Europe has huge rates of addiction to alcohol, but every other country is up there, every European country. U.S. and Canada aren't even on that, okay? So don't tell me the Europeans have it all figured out. I don't buy it. Okay, I'm going to skim this because of who I, have, who, who I have in the room, but the third component to who might struggle with addiction is a person who's escaping psychologic trauma. Okay, because there's no faster way to numb up pain from having had grown up in a lot of hardship than to drink or to drug. People turn to it because they're escaping the very deep internal pain that they cannot tolerate. This is what we know. And if you're not addressing the trauma that people have experienced who struggle with addiction, you're not really getting at the real problem. So how do we know this stuff? There's a great study called the ACE study. Who knows the ACE study in the room? Great, that's a high number for a room. But what's amazing is how few people know it, because this thing is absolutely critical. So this is a study out of Kaiser San Diego that asked 10 questions to adults about their childhood. I usually read the questions, I'm not gonna read the questions, but about every horrible thing that might have happened to a child growing up. They asked these questions. And what they realize is that when you do the survey of these 10 questions, and everybody's gonna get this slide deck, you can go home and Google it all if you want, um, that if you score out of a scale of zero to 10, a six or higher on this survey about how you were treated growing up in your house, if you score a six or a higher, you just shave 20 years off your life. You, you just cut your life expect expectancy by 20 years. You have a much higher rate of asthma, COPD, heart attacks. Name the chronic condition, this predicts for it. It's the best predictor we know of who's going to struggle with addiction. That's what I will say. And I use the ACE score in my office all the time to help me figure out why it is I'm not able to help this person enough. It usually means I'm missing something. And when I pull this thing out and I realize, holy smokes, I've really been missing something, um, it's often the first time that person has ever described this to anybody. Right? And what do they need? They need somebody who's really good at doing trauma treatment. Right? And that's different than just talk therapy. And for people in this room that work with kids who already are therapists or work with addiction, you need to know who your trauma therapists are locally. You've got to figure out who those people are because they're going to be your biggest resource. So three things that will predispose our kids to addiction, genetics, childhood trauma, and early exposure. And what my message is to you guys is talk to your kids. Just talk to your kids. And the message is delay your use. 
Talking to a 10th grader, horses out of the barn, the average age of first use of a substance is 12, 13, or 14. Okay? That's a fifth grade conversation. That's really what it is. And it, you don't have to go into lots of uh, extensive details, but you know, our sixth graders are vaping nicotine. They are vaping nicotine. So that's a sixth grader, so it would be good to talk to them in fifth grade. So let's talk about it. Alcohol use, the lowest we've ever seen. Cigarettes are so low that they're going to disappear. Illicit drugs is flat and creeping up, but that's because marijuana is still on the illicit drug list. But this is about the only spike you see in tobacco is e-cigarettes, right? And what do kids say about e-cigarettes? What do they tell you? What would you say? They say? Yeah, they say they're harmless. Do they actually say they're healthy, like their health benefit? Yeah. Better than smoking, but harmless. They'll say, it's just water vapor and flavor. There's nothing in there. You're crazy, Mom. I, my kid said that to me. I, almost, I couldn't believe it. But So kids use this stuff, and they think it is harmless. And when we do surveys, you know, it's a huge number of kids. It's about a third of all kids are vaping right now. Like, big, bad, scary number. Now, I'm not saying every day, but in the last 30 days is what the surveys are showing. And what I'll say, it tends to be communities that have some affluence. You need money to vape. You do. You can't, this stuff isn't free. It's actually expensive. So your community is not immune from this problem. I guarantee you. Does anybody think you have vaping going on in the middle school and the high school? Right? Who's in the, who's in the school in this room? Like a teacher or something? Are you finding vape pens? Say it again. Your parents. Anybody work in the school? Do you find vape pens? You know that you're using it. Does anybody, is anybody in charge of the finding of them? No. Yeah, you are? But five zero, yeah. And that kid was distributing. They were selling them. Yeah, fifty. They were making some money. Yeah, they. Yeah. So let's talk about how you get this stuff. First of all, let's just let's just talk about this. Let me go in, and then we'll talk about how you access it. So this is what the kids say: it's just water vapor and flavor. But when we do studies on really what's in this stuff, we there's a serve, there's a study that came out just nine months ago, and it's it evaluated only American made e-cigarettes, not the 90% of the market that comes from China, which is 90% of the market from China. I just looked at, we just looked at the stuff in the U.S., all labeled zero milligrams of nicotine. What percent of it had nicotine in it? 90. Only 90% had nicotine in it, right? So here we have an industry that is largely unregulated. Nobody checks them, right? Uh, they, don't, they got a pass in the most recent administration. They said, well, we're going to give you to the year 2022 to get yourself in order. And then we'll start deciding how we're going to regulate you as the FDA. So here we have zero milligrams of nicotine. 90% of it has nicotine in it, okay? So here I have these kids who think it's nothing. Water vapor and minty flavor, all good, but yet they're getting addicted to nicotine, which is a super addictive substance. It's one of the most addictive substances. So, um, and this is how the stuff looks, right? It is billed in a thousand different ways. It comes in a little container that looks like an apple juice box in a kindergarten class. It looks like ready whip whipped cream. It comes in vanilla wafer flavor. Google it tonight, guys. Look at all the flavor of e-juice that you can buy. Thousands, and it's targeting our kids, right? This is not for a truck driver who's trying to stop smoking. That's not what this is intended for. It is intended to addict our kids. Again, your job when you're selling an addictive substance is to make sure the young people get addicted. So of course they're putting nicotine in it. Why would that surprise anybody? I'm not paranoid. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. This is common sense stuff. And don't you think we could regulate this? Don't you think the government could say, oh no, you can't do that anymore. It's bad. That's the government's job is to protect us. They're not protecting us on this. The FDA stepped in for the first time about a month ago and they wrote letters to some of the main people and said, you stop, you stop that now. Useless. That's useless, right? You need a million dollar fine and you're not allowed to ship to Connecticut. That's what you're going to do. How? So where do people buy this? Online, right? And how, how old do you have to be to purchase it? 18. And how are you 18 online? I'm 18. I'm 18, right? That's all it takes, okay? That's all it takes. Um, so what do you need to buy something online? A credit card. Now, our, some of our kids have credit cards, right? Or debit cards because they have a bank. Or they got a $50 Visa gift card from their grandparent for Christmas. Who remembers where their kid's gift card from Christmas was spent? I have no idea. They got some gift cards, but I didn't track it. I wasn't paying attention. I don't know. They used it. They probably bought clothes, but I don't know. So my point is, is kids, even our kids who don't have credit cards, sometimes have access to online purchasing. The other thing is, my Amazon account is off and up, right? It's just up, because I forget to exit out. 
Um, and I, I follow what we're buying, but sometimes we're wicked busy. Do I follow everything? Sometimes my husband buys crazy stuff on Amazon. I don't know who bought it. I would be alerted, I think, in my own head if I saw a vape product get purchased. You've got to pay attention to the best of your ability. I am, my kids have bank accounts and debit cards now, and I'm their co-signer on their bank, and so their accounts pop up on my phone, and I track what they buy, right? They buy clothes and jewelry. But if they had an Amazon purchase and I didn't know what it was for, I would say, what's that Amazon purchase? And they'd say, oh, it was for Sydney's birthday. And I was like, what'd you buy, Aaron? And they would tell me, and I'd be like, okay. But you know, you gotta pay attention, because our kids get access to this, okay? Or they buy it from their friend at school who's distributing it for money. Um, the Juul cigarettes don't lie. They say, hi, we're filled with nicotine. Every one of those little tiny USB port looking things, they're tiny and they look like a USB card that is charging in your computer because that's what they do. They're magnetic so while it's charging in your laptop and the teacher comes by, you just swipe it like this and it sweeps underneath and it's magnetized to the bottom of the desk. I didn't look at the paper to to the rolls in the bathroom here, but I could have because I used the bathroom before I should have looked. That's often where they're hidden is inside the toilet paper rolls. So kids can go in, their buddies know it's in the third stall in the downstairs girls bathroom and they can take us some hits of nicotine you know, in the middle of class. This is the real, so that's problematic, but they also are now using THC or marijuana through these pens at school. So our kids are high at school. That for me is a massive problem. Like both of these are massive problems. And this is what this generation's doing. They're not doing other stuff. They're not doing some of the stuff I did in the 80s, right? But they're doing this other stuff and we're allowing it to happen as society because we're not regulating it. So the jewels are equal to a pack of cigarettes. And in fact, they're more addictive than a pack of cigarettes. Because when you smoke a cigarette, that first one third has the nicotine in it. And then as you smoke through that final two thirds, the nicotine goes down. The jewels have an even amount of nicotine all the way through the 200 puffs. So they're even more addictive. I have 15 year olds who have to wear a patch, a nicotine patch to school to get through the day because they're addicted to nicotine. Okay, um, so let's just spend, I know Red Sox, Yankees are occurring, but I want us to spend a few minutes on opiates because um, I think in today's day of 2018, it's, um, we have to acknowledge it, right? It's a massive, massive health crisis in our society. There's no doubt in my mind that pills and people like me who trained in the 1990s are at fault for creating the opiate ep epidemic. Pills and the overprescription of opiates for 20 years caused this, it is the root cause. Um, there are other root causes as well, but this is one of them. When you look at this country compared to every other country in the world, we prescribe opiates like crazy, right? Do we have more pain than Canada or Norway? No, probably not. Um, some people would argue that we're fatter and we eat much more sugar and that does cause more pain, right? I acknowledge that, but I don't think that that gets fixed by opiate prescribing. So we overprescribed and that created it. Um, what we know now is more people die of, of drug overdose by opiates than AIDS at the peak of the AIDS epidemic, than all motor vehicle accidents, than all gun violence. Um, right now, it is the number one cause of death under the age of 50, is death by an opiate. We lost more people, 72,000 people, more people than the Korean and, and the Vietnam War combined. That was in one year. So this is the country, 2003 to 2014. So this is not that recent, this is four years old. But the red area here is drug overdoses. And look how red the country starts to get. This is before fentanyl hits our country. Fentanyl doesn't arrive till about 2015 and routine use distributed, okay? So at this point, in New England at least, in other parts where fentanyl is really common, that map is like deep maroon and it's the entire country. There's no place that is, that is, uh, is protected from this one. The original heavy uh, pills coming to New England came up I-95. We used to call it Oxy Highway in the late 90s and early 2000s. There were these 600 pill mills in Florida. You didn't need any medical problem to walk in. You just need a wad of cash and they would hand you a stack of scripts and pills. There was a whole tourist industry that would take buses down to Florida. You had your whole way paid, hotels, meals. You just had to walk into two clinics a day. Didn't need a limp, didn't need a diagnosis, right? And you got walked out with all this stuff. And in 2009 and 2010, the federal government looked at Florida and said, you are destroying the Eastern seaboard. We're cutting, we're cutting you off, no federal funds. Get this place under control. So the DEA came in and they shut down the pill mills shut them all down. 34 doctors went to federal prison, right? They're still in federal prison because they weren't doctors, they were drug dealers. They weren't practicing any kind of medical care. They were handing pills to anybody who wanted them for cash. So the problem is now I have two million Americans addicted to opiates up and down I-95 and my source, my supply has been cut out. What are we left with? 
Yeah, so here's the unintended consequence of a good action. I want those pill mills shut down, right? But you're left with really cheap, pure, incredibly deadly heroin. Pills can kill you. Heroin can really kill you. We weren't prepared for this. 2012, we were not ready for this thing, and we started watching people die. And we, you know, I, I've been with this process for 18 years as a clinician, and it got bad then. So I, I like this map because it describes what I just said. That bottom is 1999 to 2010. Those red states are overdose states. Once the pill mills get shut down in 2010, look how many more overdoses we have. And again, don't get me wrong, Florida needed to shut down. It's just that we needed to have been prepared, and we were not prepared at all for what happened. Um, 2015 is when we start to see fentanyl come. That's when synthetic opiates is. That's really what kills you, fentanyl. Fentanyl kills you because look how little, that's a penny, the little dust on the right, that's the amount of fentanyl you need to die. And how's somebody who's using heroin going to see that? How are they going to even know, right? We find fentanyl in marijuana, we find it in cocaine, we find it in everything now, right? Those bath salts, God knows what was in there, probably some kind of fentanyl, right? Fewer, you know, that New Haven thing that happened this summer with the, with the, um, manufactured bath salt drugs. They didn't find fentanyl there, but clearly there was a chemical there that was bad for people. So county by county map of this country, those dark counties are places where you can still, people in those counties, there's a bottle to a bottle and a half per person of opiate in those counties. So we still have heavily prescribed opiates in certain parts of the country. And when those, those, those counties get sort of mass, I'm sorry, Medicaid and Medicare saying no more opiates, they will convert to heroin. Because once you shut down the pill mill, you're left with a really deadly drug. You want, those, you want those counties to be prepared. You want them to have clinicians who know what they're doing. You want them to have a methadone clinic. You want treatment to be available. That's not the way it works, though. So how do our kids get opiates? Thank God, thank God, the opiate problem amongst our, our adolescents has really gone down, down, down mainly because the number one place kids used to get opiates was from us in our house in our medicine cabinet. We kept bottles of stuff and left it in some cabinet in the kitchen. And your teenager at 15 started taking it. So most of us don't have this stuff in our house. And I'll be honest, if you have anything at your house, you have an old bottle of Vicodin or Percocet or something that you're saving for a rainy day, <gasps> Well, first of all, unless you're actively using it, get it out of your house. Even a bottle of Xanax or Valium, they all have street value. Get it out of your house, bring it to a drug take back place. And most police stations in Connecticut have that now, and you guys have that. It's, it's, it's anonymous, just drop it off. Anything you have, go to your parents' house because they've got pills that don't belong there anymore and they're confused, get them out of their house. Um, if you have pills you're actively using, get them under lock and key. Right? They should be under lock and key. So where do our kids get it, uh, exposed to opiates? When they're injured, right? When they're injured. If your kid has cancer and they're in pain, you give them opiates. You don't ask any questions. But if your kid has an injury or their tonsils get removed or they have wisdom teeth out or they have a knee injury, the question you ask the clinician is, how can I help my child with their pain without exposing or limiting their exposure to opiates? That's the only question. And then they'll stand there and they'll pause and hopefully they won't stare too much, and then they'll give you an answer. They'll say, well, we could try to you know, add Tylenol plus Motrin. I'll use a long-acting bupivacaine, and we'll do the nerve block. They'll come up with a strategy. But your job as an adult is to limit the exposure to opiates as much as possible, because this is a developing brain, right? Anybody ever been high on opiates in the room besides me? Come on, right, right? You get high on it? Oh, awesome stuff. And I don't abuse drugs, but I had, my, I had a root canal, and I, I, was, I was training for a marathon. And the guy was like, I got 10 miles, I got to run today. And he was like, you're going to be in pain. I was like, I'll be fine. I took a Vicodin and I ran through three states, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts. <laughs> I ran 27 like, miles that day. It was a 10 mile run. 27 miles later, I was like, man, that was the best run of my life. And it wasn't until I hit the, my house, I was like, I'm high as a kite. In that moment, I was 35 at the time, I thought, wow, I like this stuff. It is a reason I can't use it. I'm the kind of person who looks at my doctor and says, don't prescribe that for me. I get high as a kite, not good for me. But that was a 35-year-old brain talking, right? That wasn't me when I was 15 and anxious and depressed. I'm glad I didn't get exposed to it then. Um, if you love somebody who struggles with addiction, if you take care of people, you work in an office where there's, there's a lot of addiction, you need to have Narcan available to you. It's no big deal. Um, it's a nasal spray. It looks like Flonase. I have it, I have it here, it's just like a little squirt up the nose. You can go anywhere online, go to Get Naloxone Now. It'll tell you how to recognize somebody's overdosing, how to use it. This is available 
in any pharmacy without a prescription. That's true in Connecticut too, right? Any pharmacy without a prescription, and it runs under your insurance. You just walk in, you say, I need some Narcan. They, don't, they shouldn't ask you why you need it. It's none of their business, okay? I carry it on me all the time because I'm a first responder person. Schools have it? Okay. The nurses are trained, but do they have it? Okay, so I will say New Canaan then is the, one of the only schools I know of in Connecticut who's done that, and thank God for that. Because quite honestly, we don't know what's going on in the school. There's a gazillion EpiPens floating around. We know that. I'd like to have one Narcan in the school, because you don't know whether it's going to be a teacher, a visitor, or a kid. Right? A kid goes down, is not breathing. Are you going to cause them any harm? You always call 911 first. Will you cause them harm if you administer Narcan? No, no harm. I don't care if they're having a seizure. You're not going to hurt them. You may not have helped them, but you will not hurt them. And the faster you can get somebody breathing again and get oxygen to the brain, the better it is, okay? Connecticut's a little further behind in terms of Narcan distribution, right? Every patrol car in Massachusetts carries Narcan. Every school has Narcan in it. Um, and I'd like Connecticut to get there. You know, it didn't take a, it didn't take a legislative action in, Connecticut, in Massachusetts. Just the school nurses got together at a conference and said, we're going to get Narcan. The company that makes Narcan gives it to schools for free. Does it co doesn't cost the district anything. So good for New Canaan for doing that. Okay, people get better with addiction, but it's not easy. It's hard to get better, and that's why this is all about prevention. But to get better, it takes a lot of different things. Everybody needs a sober, stable housing situation. If you're going back to an unstable situation, you're going back to live with the bad girlfriend, you're not going to get better. I guarantee you, and what we do not have in this country is long-term sober living. We're missing that everywhere, and it's a massive problem. So the next time somebody comes to the New Canaan Select Board and says, I want to build a sober house, I hope people in this room show up at that meeting and say sober houses are good for our community because we need more of them. We need 20 times more than we have. So don't be not in my backyard about that. People in New Canaan struggle with addiction. They need a place that gives them the support that they need to stay better. I'm a big believer in medicine, whether it's naltrexone, methadone, buprenorphine. I don't care what it is. If it helps people stay alive, I'm on board with it. And I've been a prescriber of those medicines for a long time. Therapy trauma work, medicine for psychiatric illness, peer-to-peer -peer recovery, 12-step, I don't care what it takes. It usually takes a lot of things for people to get better. So these are all books on addiction that I think are good. This is a good time. If you think you're never going to get the slide deck or bother opening it because you're too busy, this is a good time to take out your smartphone and take a picture because these are great books. If you came here and thought, wow, I learned a little bit, I'm all done, that's fine. If you thought, I learned a little bit, I want to learn more, any one of these books would be good. The middle top book called The Body Keeps the School Gore is the best book on trauma I've ever read. So if you're in a helping profession where you take care of human beings, you might want to read that book. It has changed how I am as a doctor. My husband read it too. He's also a doctor. It has made us much better at our jobs. That book has really shifted me. That's a great book. But all, who's read any of these books? What did you guys read? Beautiful boy. Heartbreaking. A beautifully written book about a dad who's a journalist watching his son Nick struggle with addiction. And you don't know how Nick's even going to make it, right? It's a beautiful, I cried, like, you read those books, it's heartbreaking. And then Nick, the son, actually came out with a book called Tweak, about sort of his next stage of his life, because Nick's doing well. And then David Sheff wrote that book about, called Clean, about sort of the failed uh, addiction treatment programs that we have in this country. Anyway, these are great books. I have a website, it's my name, ruthpote.com, and on it is a calendar. I come to Connecticut not so much. I come maybe once a month or so, somewhere. Uh, but I have videos of this talk. I mean, I change my talk all the time, um, but a talk like this, if you thought, wow, I wish my sister-in-law had seen her, go to this website and send it to her. It's fine with, I mean, whatever. She, go give the talk to her at Thanksgiving. Do whatever you want. <laughs> um, but that's my website. So um, I have time for questions for sure, for those who don't have to leave, which is also fine if anybody has to leave. I'm probably not going to stay to do personal talk, which I usually do very long because I have a three-hour drive, and I'm sorry about that. So what questions do people have? Yes? I, I can't get any advice to get a kid off. Rated them R-A-I-D-E-D. -E -D. Yeah. yeah, they're really mad at Juul. Juul's really addictive. To get yourself off of Juul, you have to be weaned off of it the way you'd have to get off cigarettes. So it's a step-down approach. Um, yeah. Yep, patches and gum and, 
and they and you know with the patch and with the gum and with the smoking things they have a they you go down in milligrams four milligram two milligram the patches are 21 14 and seven yeah that's what it takes to get off most pediatricians are like i've never written for a nicotine patch in my life and i'm like mm -hmm, i know it's no big deal to do it right they're pra they're over the counter nicotine patches they co get covered by insurance yeah now jewel i'm not I hate these companies, right? I'd torch them all if I could. I imagine they have some step-down version of their product too, like, but I don't know that actually. Yeah, no, the FDA is ticked at Juul. They understand how addictive their substance is and that they really have targeted kids for sure. But they will continue to thrive. Of all the companies, that one I think is going to continue to do well. So um, your kid has a very strong nicotine addiction and it's real. And what I also don't want is for them to turn to paper cigarettes because that's what the industry wants. The industry is sad to have lost that market, and they are backdooring our kids into that market. So yeah, patch and a step down with gum on the in-between. And you ch people who've never used nicotine gum, you chew it, chew it, chew it, you release the nicotine, then you park it on the side of your mouth. It doesn't taste great. Then you, when you need it again, you chew it, chew it, chew it, then you park it. But also remember, there's, you know, the kid, they're, they're missing something with fingers and mouth too with the jewel, so it's complicated. The good news is you have a kid who started at a younger age but hasn't been at it for 20 years, right, and has a neuroplastic changing brain that will get better. But the sooner we get them unaddicted from nicotine, the better. Yes, oh, two questions, let me do you and then you, yeah. Oh, yep, they do. Nic uh, video games can be, for some of our kids, unbelievably addictive, and they exhibit the addictive behaviors that are worrisome to us. They have compulsive use. They have to do it. They have cravings, the thing they think about all the time. They have continued use despite harm. I told you, you can't play that video game or I'm gonna take it away and, and you're not gonna get to do this thing. They don't care, right? That's continued use despite harm. And there's a final C in the addiction. So it's absolutely an addictive behavior for some of our kids. Now, some of our kids use video games appropriately and can limit the use, right? But for some kids, it is absolutely addictive. And we have seen PET scans. I went to an entire conference by a guy from Connecticut who, this is his specialty, on video game addiction. And uh, he had PET scan after PET scan of watching the dopamine break in the brain. And it breaks in a similar way. Yes, it is. Yeah, it is. It's but right. No, I don't. So it, that's going to be a complicated thing because now what you've done is you've entered into a very strong negative relationship with your kids. So the problem with addiction is you and I presume there's control, but the problem is there isn't control. There's no control. It's a loss of control. So the notion of reducing use is really hard to do. So there are in Connecticut, and I'll Google it and, and maybe send it if you don't already know what it is. I'll come up with his name if I think hard enough. Excellent. That's exactly who it is. And where is he? He's out of Hartford. Did you guys hear that? David Greenfield. And he does just video game and screen addiction work. He has inpatient program. His whole therapy is based on that. He's a PhD, and this is his specialty. And luckily, he's really close by. That's exactly who it is. And he's, he has a whole institute. And I found his website really helpful, if anybody else been there. He's speaking next week in Trumbull. Awesome, fabulous. And I've never seen him speak to this kind of audience, but he's a very good speaker. So there's great, great communication. Thank you. Yeah? It is. The, that exact, exactly what he just said. It was actually a study, and the CDC has been promoting it quite a bit, but Tylenol is different than, than ibuprofen. And I have to say, most people don't seem to know that, right? I know that, and people in medicine know that, but most of us think it's the same drug. It isn't. Motrin and Advil and ibuprofen, that's the same drug. Tylenol, totally different. One goes through the kidneys, one goes through the liver. When you use them together, not alternating them like you had when you had a baby with a fever, but when you use them together at normal doses, they are more effective than five milligrams of oxycodone with fewer bad side effects. So that's what we do for pain management. But it takes a little more work to sit down and be like, this is the amount of ibuprofen I need you to use, and this is the amount of Tylenol. And it, I do this because I have arthritis. I feel like I'm taking a whole handful of drugs, because I am. But it's OK, right? It's all good. I'm taking the right doses, but it's like five or six pills in my, a cup of my hand. But that is exactly right. And that's the first thing we should be doing for pain management, even post-surgery, post-wisdom teeth. Like, that's first. The opiates are sort of when things are out of control. Yeah. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's that's great. Yeah, yeah. So that's good. So there's a testimony. So do you guys know? So who in this room has had either a root canal or wisdom teeth out? And how many opiates have you been given? Oh my God! What? What year was that? Oh, you had shoulder surgery. Ninety is a lot for shoulder shoulder surgery too. But shoulder. Wow. Shoulder surgery is painful. And how much did you use? You use zero. Wow. So this is what we find is that prescribers give you 30, 60, or 90. Has to be in some 30, you know, like we can't do eight. We just can't ever write eight. Um, and then when we ask people how many did you use, they use almost none of it, right? So the average wisdom tooth person, because I've asked thousands of people this question, how much did you use with your wisdom teeth? Average use is zero, two, four. The most I've ever heard is six, the most. One time from the back of the room, a guy said, I use 60. And I was like, man, that went badly. And he said, but I'm an addict. And I was like, got it, right? Right there, got it. So six. Your daughter gets her wisdom teeth out. The most you ask for is six. And most of them you're going to end up bringing to the police station. And you're going to administer the medicine. Kids cannot control their own medicines. They just can't. They're, they're not, they shouldn't control their own medicine. Any other questions? You guys have been so nice. Thanks for having me here. I really appreciate it. <laughs>